It'll be the first place. First place will be is First Kings chapter eleven. I didn't know, you know, we, we talked about, and I guess Jack said, you know, tomorrow's holiday, we won't have evening service tonight. And so that kind of cleared up. I didn't know whether or not this was going to be the evening ser a sermon or a morning one. Uh, typically, the way I kind of have it in my mind is the evening sermons, I would rather them be a little bit deeper. You know, as time goes, Lord willing, we add people here or there. If people actually start coming and, uh, you know, people go to church, um, Typically, your more faithful people go to Sunday nights. You know, the the people come in the mornings and whatnot. And so, the deeper doctrinal sermon I'd rather do in the evening. But you're going to get the deeper doctrinal sermon here in the morning. Uh, so, there's a lot of Bible in this, which shouldn't be shouldn't be bad on us. I mean, as Christians, we should want a lot of Bible. Uh, but it, but you may find yourself having to you know engage in thought. And so, the topic I want to I want to talk about and preach on this morning is the doctrine, one of the foundational doctrines really of this church. Uh, we would put it in the inserts when we go out and evangelizing. And the name of the doctrine that is commonly called is once saved, always saved. In other words, once you are saved, you cannot lose your salvation. And there's many doors I've knocked on in this, in this town over the years. I remember one over toward the police department. I knocked on their house, and I talked to them, and they said straight up to me, I said, you know, I just don't believe in that once saved, always saved. And there's a lot of confusion on the topic. Some people believe that you can lose your salvation if you commit a heinous sin. Some people believe you can lose your salvation if you just lose some faith. Um, they, they really don't know, honestly, if you were to ask my, my view on it, most people don't know what they really believe. They just know that they don't think that a Christian can, quote, live how they want and uh, live in sin or however you want to put it. And so there's a lot of confusion on the topic. But what I want to do is I want to go to the Bible and do kind of a quick overview and give you a simple argument, uh, three different arguments, for why I believe the Bible clearly teaches that once you're saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. And it's actually a foundational and crucial understanding because, honestly, the majority of times someone believes they can lose their salvation, they probably don't have salvation because they, it shows they have a misunderstanding of how to be saved in the first place. And I'll get into that too. You know, the Bible talks about this later on in 1 John. One of the main reasons John wrote the book of 1 John, he says, is that you may have joy. And there's a certain truth. When you know you're saved and forgiven of your sins, you're happy. Yes. Yes. Like naturally, you're happy. What do you have to be sad about? Yes, in this life there's pain, there's misery, there's sorrow, there's hardship, there's trials. But ultimately, like we just now saying, we'll fly away, you know. Ultimately, when you breathe your last breath, you know, God will take you to heaven. Or when the rapture happens, God will take you to heaven. At the end of the day, you know, no matter what comes, we have the love of God abiding on us rather than the wrath of God, like people who aren't saved. And so salvation is really under attack and it's under attack not just showing people a false way of salvation, like Jehovah's Witnesses come into your house and trying to tell you about a false God and a false way to, uh, to heaven, but it's under attack uh, once you are saved. And so these different words, the big words that they would use is justification. That is how you get saved, just as if you've never sinned before God, right? You're justified before God. God looks at you as if you're good, as if you're just. Well, the other doctrine is one known as sanctification, that is, once you're saved, you're made holier, you become more like Christ. You're not perfect, but you're, you're on this sanctifying path. And that is true, and that is really, both of those are hit on by this false doctrine that you can lose your salvation. It really kind of injects itself into both of those teachings. They have to change the way that salvation works, and they have to change the way that sanctification works. And I'll get into that and make it a little bit... Um, a little bit more clear as we go. So if you're in 1 Kings chapter 11, um, which and trust me, there's a, there's a lot of different scriptures I'll be going through. I want to I mention this. So I'm going to make three basic arguments. And I don't want anybody to confuse this, um, especially Jack or somebody that may know the Bible in, in, in great depth. This isn't a perfect and total refutation of people that think you can lose your sin. Um, and this isn't as good a case as I could make that you're, once you're saved, you're always saved. Rather, my goal is I want you guys to see in three simple ways 
how the Bible shows you can't lose your salvation. So it's a basic argument, in other words. I'm not hitting everything I could hit. Uh, if that was the case, we'd, I'd have to be like Paul, and we'd have to stay here overnight, and you know, people would be falling over dead and out of windows. So you know, there's not enough time to do that. So just a concise look at this. So the first thing, you say, well, why in the world are we in 1 Kings chapter 11? You know, if you know your Bible, you know what we're getting ready to look at. Well, the first thing I want to say here is this. A lot of times people will say, well, if you commit some sin or if you lack in faith, well, you've fallen from grace and, you know, you're not saved anymore. That's really one of the chief things that people attack because they'll say, well, you can't live how you want to. So they imply that once you're saved, once you believe on Christ, once you trust him as your Savior, you've called on the name of the Lord, you have you know, the Holy Spirit in you, well, now I've committed some sin and I'm not saved anymore. That's what they try to teach. Well, let's just look at the Bible and let's see, does that add up? And, you know, you may be shocked to see some of this stuff here. 1 Kings chapter 11, I'm just going to start reading here in verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Little g. Solomon clave unto these in love. So Solomon doesn't listen to what God says. He starts gathering together all these different, you know, heathen wives. And God doesn't warn him, when you do that, they're going to turn your heart away from the Lord. Yeah. Verse 3, and he had 700 wives, princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. That's just different false gods of these other heathen uh, pagan people. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and lost his salvation. Is that what it says? No. You won't find that in this chapter. It says he did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then, and note that right there. It's an interesting way of putting it. Not fully after the Lord. Now, these people, just a quick little break. These people that want to say, well, you can lose your salvation if you ain't living it. Who is living it fully? Very few men of God have, have, have lived lives that you couldn't point to something. Even David had said that went fully after the Lord. We go look at David's life, there's going to be some stuff popping up. Yeah. And so these people that want to say you can lose your salvation if you're not fully living it, they ain't fully living it. Their preacher ain't fully living it. Ain't no man alive fully living it. And, and each person, you know, varies once once another. Oh, I got cussing, B. I don't cuss anymore. What well, do you drink? Oh, I beat drinking. You know, oh, well, do you gamble? Oh, I don't gamble or, or drink or smoke or do none of these things. Oh, well, do you lust with your eyes? There's not anybody who's fully delivered from sin on this planet. Just a quick side. Can't help myself. And it says, verse 7, Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is in Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of uh, the children of Ammon. So all these different gods. He's just, you know, and this is the way that I see it. I don't, I don't see Solomon as just fully worshiping these gods. What, instead, what I think is happening here, I could be wrong, but this is the impression that I have, it seems like with all these different wives he has, he's just kind of giving them leeway. Okay, yeah, set that up. You can, you can worship that. Oh, you know, and so he's just kind of nodding the head at these other things. And it's, it's similar to how these guys, a lot of Christian men, good godly men, they get older in their age and they get watered down. And all of a sudden, like Billy Graham and late in his life is like holding hands with Catholics. You know, later on in life, there's just something that happens with people. They get super liberal. Oh, don't judge them for that. Oh, you know, well, maybe Catholics are Christians too. And all this kind of stuff starts happening. And they just get, they really like lean off, you know, well, you know, let them do their thing. And so Solomon seems to, oh yeah, set up that Astro pole. Oh yeah, let's do this. And starts paying, you know, homage or respect in any way to these other gods. And it says, likewise, he did for all his strange wives, which burn incense and sacrifice on their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord's God of Israel. Uh, and, you know, I'm just going to stop right there. I, could, I was planning on keep reading, but I 
you know, I'm reminded of how much scripture I actually want to get through in this. And so just know this. Solomon is going to end up dying, uh, essentially, um, if you go to the end of 1 Kings 11, you can see verse 41, the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over Israel was 40 years, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. He dies by the end of this chapter. This is the end of Solomon's life. Now, if we were to go by what all these people say about losing your salvation if you fall into sin, Solomon's in hell. Do you think Solomon's in hell? No. Absolutely not. But you see how, how it just doesn't add up biblically. Oh, if you fall into some sin, you must lose your salvation. Well, then how can you say Solomon's saved? He fell into in idolatry. You say, well, how does that happen? I don't know. I think that's one of the biggest blemishes on Solomon's life, honestly. That's a heinous sin. It's almost unthinkable of how Solomon could do that with all the blessings he received from God, all the wisdom that God gave him. But the Bible records it. Uh, go to Galatians 2 now. Because some people would say, well, that's the Old Testament. You know, an Old Testament worked differently. And there's some, in some sense in which there is some truth to that. In the Old Testament, there's, there's things that's different in the New Testament. Obviously, the Holy Spirit did not indwell all believers. And so, in a sense, in the New Testament, you got even less of an excuse to fall into such sins. Now, I want to look here at the second thing, just to highlight, we're talking about the, uh, the truth that believers can fall into sin. Now, if you remember, uh, a week or two ago, I preached on the new man, old man, uh, old man and the new man, and the conflict between someone who's saved and their flesh. And that, that right there, by the way, will explain to you a lot of stuff of what we're talking about here. But you remember in that one, I talked about how Peter denied Jesus three times. Okay, so just right out the gate, we're talking about, well, some sin can lose, you can cost you your salvation. You can be saved, and then oh, now you're not saved anymore. Well, what sin would do that? Would you not think it would be denying the Lord Jesus Christ three times? Do you think that would do it, but it didn't cost Peter his salvation? Look here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul records him coming, and Peter didn't just mess up that one. He said, well, Peter just messed up early on, uh, and, you know, after that he didn't mess up anymore. Galatians 2, verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came from James, and he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. In other words, Barnabas even was carried away with this. And that right there, by the way, kind of speaks to Barnabas' character. You know, it's like, even Barnabas, you know, that guy was so godly, you would never think that he would got carried away in that. But quick aside again, these great men of God, even they can fall into sin. You know, don't think you stand, oh, you know, I won't fall. Well, they fell. They didn't lose their salvation, but they fell into sin. And it keeps going. Verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. And by the way, this is another verse that refutes all these cowardly people. Don't say nothing publicly. Don't say nothing. You, know, you don't name names. He got in Peter's face publicly and called him out for this sin. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as, the, uh, as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Who, it says, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And I remember, this just reminds me real quick, I'll mention it. When I first started working at the town uh, years back, you know, soon afterward, I guess a couple years went by, uh, well, three or four years went by, and then I kind of, I got right with God. I started going to church. I, I, I gave my life to the Lord. I rededicated, so to speak. And I got on fire for God. I started reading my Bible a lot. And I had people tell me, better be careful, don't backslide, you know, you'll fall from grace. And I was like, that ain't going to happen, you can't lose your salvation. But I didn't know the Bible well enough. And I got my dump truck one day, no joke, and I don't advise this, but I had my Bible in my hand and I said, I prayed, I said, God, I said, I don't know 
where to go for this. I said, but I know what these people are saying is a lie. You know, show me. And I flipped open randomly, and I went to the book of Galatians. And lo and behold, the book of Galatians is a very good refutation of this false doctrine. And I'll come back to it. But just really briefly, I'm going to turn to a few places. You just you don't have to go there. There's no way you could keep up. Uh, maybe Jack could. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't want to try to make you talk. You'll be turning. You won't be listening. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures here to you. In Luke 9, it says, And it came to pass that on the next day they were come down from the hill. Much people met him. And again, we're on the topic of uh, these, these people committing sins, right? Or now, and not just sin. Peter had the sin of favoritism, by the way. That's what he was doing. He was showing favoritism to Jews over Gentiles. That's a big sin. You know, that's, and that's a gospel issue. Because in Christ, we're all equal. There ain't, there ain't hierarchy. We're all equal. God loves us all equally, right? Well, getting on this topic, so we've seen idolatry from Solomon. We've seen favoritism from Peter. And, but some people say, well, if you lack faith, you know, you can't doubt. If you start losing faith, then, then you'll lose your salvation. And so that's what I'm getting at now. It says, they come down from the hill, and behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, and he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departed from him. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. And Jesus answering, look what Jesus says it now, and this is in Luke 9, verse 41. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. Now, that's in response to his disciples not being able to cast this out. And he says to these people, his disciples essentially, they're faithless. They're doubting. And this, this is not an isolated incident. And I, I honestly, I could probably go on time and time again. But I'll give you a couple more examples of this. This one's coming out of Matthew 8, verse 23. It says, when he entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. This is Jesus going into a ship. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Talking about Jesus. Jesus goes in, the, in a ball and sit, ship and he goes to sleep. Well, his disciples are still up. And watch what happens. It says, um, so it says that the great tempest of sea comes and the, 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 the ship's being covered with waves. Jesus goes to sleep. And it says, and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. In other words, we're all going to die. And it says, and he saith unto them, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? So again, we see here in Matthew, doubt, lack of faith, lack of belief. And so, I mean, again, it's, it's not painting a good picture for people that say if you doubt or lack faith in any way, then you're, you're not going to have salvation. The Bible says a grain of a mustard seed's enough, right? Childlike faith is enough. And again, one of my favorite examples, and we read through this a couple of weeks ago at some point, is in John 20 with Thomas. Look at what, look what Jesus does with Thomas. It says, after eight days again, John 20, verse 26, after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, hold my hands, reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Do you think Thomas is just now getting saved? Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. See, so Thomas, he believed in Christ, but he lacked faith. He was doubting. Peter, he believed in Christ, but he doubted. He doubted, and he rejected Christ three times. He had a, he had a low point. Have you ever had a low point in your faith? You're lying if you didn't if you didn't say you did. Everybody does. Everybody has doubts. Everybody has fears. You say, not everybody. John the Baptist did, and he was the greatest person ever lived. John the Baptist, it said, when he was in jail, he doubted and sent people to Jesus to verify, hey, are you the one? Jesus said there's none greater than John the Baptist that's been born. And you can really keep going with this. Like I said, you can, you can go literally uh, for a very long period of time showing lacks of faith and doubting in the Bible. In 2 Timothy 2, this is a good verse. Verse 13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. 
And I've seen preachers and pastors wrestle with that and commentate. It's just funny. What, find somebody trying to figure out how to get around that, right? Because it seems to say that if you lack faith, you'll still be saved. And they just don't like that. It's like this preacher on the internet last night. I, I messaged him, right? And he, he wrote this thing out, and somebody that I know had liked it. So I've seen it pop up on my Twitter feed. Twitter's a way you can just talk at each other. And this guy says, repentance is a part of salvation. You've got to repent and believe. And, you know, I'm like, I said, okay, what do you mean by repent? And again, it goes back with that quit your sins to be saved garbage that people try to teach. They don't understand that repentance is a mind change. He replied to me and said, he, he quoted some fake lexicon. It's not a real one because I know what the Greek actually definition of it is. And he said, repentance means you change your life. That's, that's the first words, you change your life. That is not what repent means. Metanoia in Greek means change mind. And he said, you change your life and you change your mind. And he, so he's changing the definition of it and trying to say, hey, you got to have all this, you know, quitting your sins. you gotta, you got to uh, clean your life up. Then you come to God. That ain't the way salvation works. You come to God in your sin. You come to God in you say, hey, I am a sinner. Right. This is what I'm doing. Please forgive me. I trust only that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. He died for me. He did the hard part. It's done. It's finished. And I trust in Jesus alone. That's how you get saved. Now, he'll change you. He'll clean you up a little bit, but you ain't going to be perfect. As we've looked, Solomon, David, Peter. I mean, you could just go through. And I, by the way, I don't think Paul was perfect by any means. Not only did he confess it himself, but I think if you read through Acts, I think he did some things that I don't really agree with. It doesn't say that it was a good idea, like shaving his head and making his friends get circumcised and whatnot. It seems like him and James got together and come up with some carnal ways of doing some stuff, and that's a whole other subject. But yeah, they're trying to get away from this reality here that the Bible says, if you lack faith, hey, if you're faithless, he remains faithful. We well, can't do nothing with that but this. If you're saved and you doubt, doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit in you, God the Father, he, he will trump that. It's like a trump card. You know, you ever played trumps? You know, I got a spade, right? We played spades, you know, any, anything like that. Well, you play rook, it's like there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a suit that you make as trumps, right? Well, no matter what you do, God has the, has the, has the bird. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No matter what you do, God is going to trump your doubt. That's, that's a joyous thing. You say, well, my goodness, it don't matter what I do. Once I'm saved, I'm always going to be saved. Yeah. Does that not make you happy? Because I'll go ahead and tell you, if there's something you could do to lose your salvation, life would be miserable because I would be doing everything I could to avoid doing that. And that's just reality. And, you know, I'll say this in brief. I think all sin, all sin is unbelief in some sense. Because you're either not believing, and this happens, it's the same for me and anybody else. When I sin, it's a form of unbelief. You say, well, why would that be? Either you don't believe God exists, and he's not, and, and so it doesn't matter what he says, or, and that would be an unsaved person, by the way, or number two, you believe God exists, but he ain't going to punish you for that sin. You see, well, I know, I mean, how many Christians don't know what they're getting ready to do is a sin? I mean, I've heard these people say, well, if you sin willfully, I mean, I'm pretty sure most of the sins I commit is pretty, pretty willful. I mean, what am I, like a robot? I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I mean, you might lose control in the sense of getting mad, right, and, and being and, and sinning in that way. But all sin you do is willful. So, you know, I've heard people say, well, it's not just sins, it's willful sins. I mean, my goodness, come on, guys. You really think, are you a robot? You don't know what you're doing? Almost all sin is willful. You don't think Peter's sin was willful when, when he denied Christ three times? Or when he started separating the Jews and the Gentiles? And he, you know, oh, here comes the Judaizers. They're the Jew. I got I to gotta go over here and I got to show how, you know, how Jewish I am. See, y'all, makes all those Gentiles feel like garbage. Makes all the people that were saved, blood-bought Christians just feel like trash. Just favoritism toward these people. It's wicked sin, but all, all sin ultimately is a form of unbelief. And inevitably, you'll have people say, you know, well, I still think you can lose it. Or that just, you know, that just sounds like a license to sin. That's, it, it, I mean, this is inevitably what people say. And, and again, I, I think, you, you know, Scripture is clear on this, but I, I love talking to people about this. Because they have no way of, of actually winning the, in the debate or the conversation. They don't have truth or logic on their side. 
So you can beat it with scripture. You can just beat it with logic and reason. Here's the thing. Somebody that says, well, you can lose your salvation, you know, if you commit a sin. Well, what sin is it? It's, it's real similar to these people, these lordship salvation people, where they say, you got to give your life to Jesus to be saved. you got to quit, quit your sins. you got to repent of all your sin to be saved. Oh, well, which ones? Well, the ones that I don't commit just so happens. It just so happens, me as the preacher, it's the sins that I don't commit that you got to repent of. Now, i got sin in my life as a preacher, but those are the sins that's okay to have in your life and be saved. you got to repent of the ones that I don't do. That's the way that these preachers do. That's what they do. Because they'll admit, oh, i got sins. No, I, don't, I, I sin daily. But you got to quit all your sins to be saved. you got to repent all your sins, right? It's, it's foolishness. And the same thing with all these people that teach. And you can line them up. The Pentecostals, the Free Will Baptists, uh, almost the, what the Methodists, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, almost all of them have this false doctrine of just coming out and saying you can fall from grace or lose your salvation. And so the question for these people, well, what sin is it that loves, what's the, what's the sin that gives it? Well, it's just not the one that they're doing, right? I went down the road one time at work with one of these Pentecostal people years ago, years and years back, and they had this doctrine, losing your salvation and tongues talking, and they'd cuss at people going down the road. I guess that sin ain't the one, though. You can cuss people out going down the road, but you know, that sin doesn't cost you your salvation, thankful to them. Well, you know, and here's what I'm getting down to. Wouldn't you think if you could lose your salvation based on committing a sin that the Bible would have it in there somewhere? Oh, by the way, if you commit this sin, you're going to lose your salvation. You'd think there'd be one clear verse that told you you're going to lose your salvation on this one sin or on these ten sins. But Catholicism's false. They have those mortal sins, right? Uh, They're just made up. There's nothing about, you know, there are some, some sins that are worse, and there are some sins that will cost you your soul. But that's not for safe people. That's for unsafe people. And that's so they just don't understand the Bible in any sense. And so, you know, I, I, a lot of that just just trying to help you see logically and reasonably from the Bible, there is no way that you can look at the men of God in the Bible, and I named them, you know, Solomon, Peter. You can't look at those men's life uh, and say there's no sin in their life at all. That's why they were saved. That's stupid. They had sin in their life. They had sin at the end of their lives. And so these people that try to say, well, you can commit a sin to lose it, it's silly, it's foolish. So believers, we know that are saved, commit sins. Now, here's a second one, and this really, to me, personally, uh, alongside, obviously, this, the, clear, the clear teaching of Scripture, yeah, that's why I believe that you can't lose your salvation. But I'll go ahead and tell you this. In light of the Bible, the whole Bible's teaching on salvation, in light of what the whole Bible teaches, that is the main reason I believe you cannot lose your salvation. And I'm going to explain that in brief to you right here. And I'll, I'll name, I named the second point here. If you want to turn to Ephesians 1, I want you to. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 with me. I named the second point biblical salvation. And so first... We know that people, good men of God and women of God in the Bible, commit heinous sins even at the end of their life, and they're still saved. Okay? Now, second, I want to show you this. The biblical understanding of salvation just totally flies in the face of anybody that thinks you can lose your salvation. And I'm going to show you that really simply. This might be the point that I think a lot of you guys understand really clearly, okay? I think this right here will show you, if you doubt it or something, if one of you guys in here have some secret doubt, well, maybe I can lose my salvation. I hope this right here will clear it up. There's no way around this, okay? Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You get that? So after you believe, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so the key word here, the truth is first, you believe, number two, you get the Holy Spirit as a seal, and then it says that that seal, the Holy Spirit in you, is the earnest. You say, well, what is earnest? That word literally means a guarantee or down payment. That's what that word literally means. 
a guarantee or down payment. So when you believe on Christ, God gives you His Holy Spirit. He gives you a new heart. He comes and lives in you. And that is your promise and your guarantee that, as the Bible says elsewhere, He who has begun a good work in you will finish it. Now, do you think that God is a liar? Do you think that God is going to give and take away? I mean, it's really a foolish thing, but I, I actually was talking about this with a guy I worked with this week, a guy that I, I led to the Lord, and I believe he's saved. He's not a perfect person, but he's growing. And uh, I was talking, I put it to him this way, and I'll put it to you guys this way too. In light of what I just now read, I want you to listen to this, what Jesus says over here in Luke, okay? Listen to this. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. I told you there's going to be a lot of Bible. I'm, I'm not going to apologize for it. This is church. <laughs> you should expect Bible. Luke 11, verse 9. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and everyone that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Doesn't sound like Calvinism to me, does it, by the way? I mean, that, that sounds kind of the opposite of Calvinism anyways. And if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a, a, a father, will he give him a stone? That's like me going to dad. I mean, my dad, I, I'm, I guess it's kind of bad. I don't want to be like one of those preachers that do it. But dad, if I ask him for something, he's going to give it to me. I know that. And so, so does other people in my family. I mean, we know that. Some people have said he's kind of mean and, you know, he, he hoards his money. But you ask dad something, he's going to give it to you. He looked up at me when I said that. Like, no, he's like, I don't worry money. I mean, he'll give you something. And I know that having three kids of my own, I mean, they don't, they don't realize it yet, and I'm glad. And I've I mentioned this kind of in brief to Ashley. I don't know if she caught it. But they always go to mommy, don't they? They're like, oh, mom, give me this. And they nag her for stuff. They don't realize I'm the one that will give them anything they really want. All they got to do, you know what I'm saying? If they give me a hug the right way, I'm the reckless one. I'll charge what we don't. I'll charge money that we don't have. You know what I'm saying? My mom's the one that is, is going to hold back. Dad's the one that's going to give you whatever you want if you just pull the right strings, man. They don't get that yet, and I'm thankful that they don't. But you know, it's the truth, right? And I'm not saying Ashley wouldn't give them anything either, but they, they just don't realize that. And what Jesus is saying here is, say, hey, you're going to go to your father, and he's going to you're like, Dad, I'm hungry. Here's a rock. I mean, that's silly, right? Well, look what he's, he keeps going. Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? Hey, can I have a fish? Uh, no, I don't want to give you that, that kind of an animal. Let me give you a snake instead. I mean, everybody wants to eat fish, except for me. I'm not a fish person myself. But I don't want to eat a snake. I know that for certain. <laughs> you give me a choice, a trout or a, a rattlesnake, I'm going to eat that trout. Okay. <laughs> and so, hey, Dad, give me, give me something to eat. Here's a snake. Here's a rock. Now, here's what gets interesting. He says, or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a, a scorpion? Now, verse 13 of Luke 11 is really profound, and I'm going to tell you why. Just in passing, this is the way that Jesus taught, and I love it. You can miss this, and this has nothing really to do with the sermon, but I'm going to teach you something really quick. He says this, If ye then, ye is plural, the these and the thous and the King James are singular. The ye's and the yours means it's a plural audience. Okay, No other Bible, by the way, does that. Just another reason to use a King James. If ye then, all of you, if ye being evil, he just assumes you're all evil, by the way. Did you get that? If you people being evil, he doesn't say, well, some of you guys are good. What else did Jesus say elsewhere? There's none good but God, right? Are you calling me God, rich young ruler? That's what he's essentially saying. Only one is good, that's God. Everybody else, you're evil. You have sin. You're wicked. You need a Savior. If ye be an evil, he says, in passing, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give? Now look what he says here. The Holy Spirit to them that ask of him. He's teaching a little bit something deeper here. He's teaching something a little bit more profound. He's taking it to salvation. So now, in light of what I read in Ephesians 1, think about this. Jesus says, anybody who asks the Father, God, save me. You're saved. You see what that's saying? You're not going to go to God and say, God, forgive me my sins. I'm wicked. Jesus died for my sins. No. You need to clean your life up. You know, you need to, you need to get some things right first. That's the only way it works, man. That's not biblical. He says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, that, just, that right there, 
just blows this Calvinistic idea of salvation out of the water where they teach you're saved, you're regenerated, and then because you're regenerated, you're going to call on the name of the Lord. Well, this right here says if you ask the Father, he'll give you the Spirit, which, by the way, is regeneration. It just blows it out of the water. But now think about that in context of what we read in Ephesians 1, that the Holy Spirit is that down payment. So let's think about this. The good Father in heaven. Oh, I'm such a good dad, you know. And, oh, you want the Holy Spirit? Here, here's the Holy Spirit. There you go. You're sealed to the day of redemption. Just kidding. Ha, ha, ha. Give it back to me. You think that's what he's going to do? Is that what a good father would do in heaven? You know, it, I mean, am I going to give my kid a rock? Here's a rock, Michael. You know, have it. I'm not going to do that when he's hungry. Or when, when, what about when one of my kids wants saved? Right? That's what God's saying as the Father in heaven. You want saved? You want forgiveness of sins? Yes, I will forgive you. I'm waiting for you to confess your sin and believe on Christ. You'll be saved, and I will seal you into the day of redemption. But these people that think you're going to lose your salvation, they come along and say God just takes that back. Now, I know the way that people argue this, and I'm going to show you something now in light of that. The natural person, someone who probably ain't saved, is going to reply to what I just now said and say, well, you just going to live how you want to then. That's what they just keep coming back. They're always going to go back to that. So you're just going to live in sin. And then what they're implying is, once you're saved, you can't sin anymore, you can't sin very much anymore, and the way to keep your salvation is by living some kind of sin-free life. Look what Galatians 3 says, though. I love this. Now, and I heard a preacher say this recently, and it's very true. Galatians not only refutes the idea that you can earn your salvation, Galatians also, Galatians also refutes the idea that you've got to keep doing good works to keep your salvation. Justification and sanctification are taught. Look at this in, in Galatians chapter 3. Really key verse. Galatians 3 verse 1 says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath, hath evidently been set forth, crucified among you. Now this is what he gets to this. So they're in false doctrine. They're, they're caught up in all these heresies. They're so far off base. He actually says in this epistle, I'm afraid of you. You guys scare me to death. What's wrong with you? I'm afraid I labored on you guys in vain. I don't even know if you guys are saved. You're believing this warped stuff? That's what he's getting at. Look what he says in verse 2. This would I learn of you. In other words, you tell me this. It's like if I was talking to somebody. Hey, you tell me this, buddy. That's what he's saying. This would I learn of you. You tell me. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You get that? He's saying, did you do some deed to get saved or did you just believe by faith? How did you begin on this path? If you're saved in here this morning, I hope we all are. How did you start down the road of being a Christian? You call on the name of the Lord in faith, right? I trust Jesus as my Savior. I believe on Him. Not my works, but what He did for me on the cross. He paid for my sins on the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again. All, be, all glory be to Him. He paid it all. All to Him I owe. You began by faith. You began by faith. That's the clear answer. Now look what he says. Are you so foolish... Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? And so what he's saying is this, do you think you began by faith alone? Are you going to be now made perfect as a Christian? Are you going to be mature as a Christian? Are you going to come to the end as a Christian in faith and save still? Is that going to happen by works? You didn't begin by works. You're not going to end by works. It's all by faith. That's why you can find a Christian who's been a Christian for 50 years. They still got sin in their life. They still struggle with some kind of sin. They still know they're a wicked sinner. They know that they're saved by grace still yet. You say, well, I know somebody that says that you know they've been a Christian for 40 years and that the way that they maintain their salvation is by going to church and by being good and by praying. They're a liar. They're not saved. If you're trusted in your works, you're not saved. That is the problem with a lot of these people that think you can lose your salvation. Not only do they sacrifice their joy. Remember what I mentioned at the first? The joy that comes with being saved forever. You're forgiven of your sins. 
It ain't on you. You trust in Christ. They've sacrificed that joy. But then you got the then you got the second problem, which is not only do they sacrifice joy by thinking they lose lose their salvation, a lot of them keep they don't even have the keys to the kingdom of God because they think they have to do good works to keep their salvation, which means they think they had to do good works to get their salvation, which means they're not saved to begin with. And that's why you say, well, that you're judgmental. Don't judge people that think they gotta keep their salvation by doing good works. Paul did. Look at verse four. Have ye suffered so many things in vain? What he's saying is, you're going through hardship in the world. The world hates you. And I'll go ahead and promise you this. If persecution hit Big Stone Gap, and they said, all right, if you're not pro-homosexual, if you're not pro-unity and everything and globalism, if you're not pro-one world order, then we're going to burn you on a stake in the middle of town. They would tie up some Pentecostals and Methodists and uh, free wills, people that lose, think you can lose your salvation, they tie them to that stake right beside me. But guess what? If their faith and trust is not solely in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it's even a little bit in their own works, they'll, they'll like Jack mentioned to them people this morning, they'll burn to death on, the, on that stake and they'll burn in hell for all eternity. You say, well, what on earth? That's what Paul's saying to these people. Have you suffered all these things in vain? Are you going to try to live this Christian life where you're, you're already obscure, you're already different than the world, you have these different views, you're not living in sin, you're not living it up like the world, the world hates you, but on top of that, you're not even saved because you're, you're trying to adhere to the law to be saved. The law doesn't save you. And that's why I preached that sermon uh, Sunday night, you know. The law doesn't save. The purpose of the law is not to save you, it's to bring you to Christ, to show you your need for Christ. And there's more. I mean, it. I guess I can go there. Go, go with me to John 4. I'm going to show you a couple things here. We have time. The, the second thing here, so the, the first one, obviously, we're talking about the nature of salvation refutes this idea that you can lose your salvation. The first one uh, I mentioned, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your earnest. He's your promise. And God is not going to be what they used to call an Indian giver, you know, here you go, here's salvation. Ha ha, just kidding. God ain't going to do that. Number two, the nature of salvation, we've seen that it was free upon request. He didn't earn it, so why would you lose it? Having begun by, the, by faith, are you going to be made perfect by the law? Obviously not. We see that you finish the same way you started. Now notice this. This is really one of the strongest arguments too. In John chapter 4, verse 7, I'm going to show you the nature of salvation being eternal life refutes the idea that you can lose it, okay? This is a very simple argument. Everybody in this room, even Michael, should be able to understand this if he pays attention. And this should stick with you the rest of your life. Very simple argument, okay? John 4, verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, Look at this. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. You see that? Now, the end of the book of Revelation gives, gives a similar uh, exhortation. And Jesus is simply telling this woman here, she, he's saying, hey, I asked you some water to drink physically. If you knew who you was talking to, you would have asked of me, and I would have given you water. He goes on to say, you drink from it, you'll never thirst again. Never thirst again. That, that being the key. Now, listen to this right here. Verse uh, in Revelation twenty two seventeen, the spirit and the bride say, "Come, let him that heareth come, uh, say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely." And so, over and over again, we see that, uh, like in John four verse fourteen, "Whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, never thirst again." Right now, look in John six. Just a couple pages over in John 6, verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you that uh, not that bread from heaven, 
But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. It says, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So he's just referencing, remember in the Exodus, when the manna came down from heaven and they were sustained by God on this temporary uh, food. Yeah. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm greater than that. I'm the, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Look what he says here in 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, let's put this together, Okay. Remember how I said even even an eight-year-old should be able to get this doctrine. Jesus says he gives you water, you're never thirsty again. He, he gives you food, you're never hungry again. Now that represents salvation. So you want to tell me that God, remember we've seen it was free upon request, right? The Heavenly Father gives freely the Holy Spirit to all who ask, right? God, give me salvation, please, I believe in Jesus alone. Here's salvation. Oh, I sinned. I'm hungry again. Does that make any sense? It's impossible. Oh, I doubted today. I'm thirsty again. No, you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst again. It's eternal. It's forever. The Bible says once you're saved, you're always saved. That's a simple doctrine. And you see, these people come to it and they'll take... What well, I'll just go ahead and tell you. They'll take verses that give you strong warning and they'll apply them to, to save people when it's, it's meant for people who aren't saved to begin with most of the time. That's the warning. Like, uh, they went out from us to be shown they were never a part of us. That's what First John says. If you, if you fly off the deep end, never go to church again, you don't believe in the Lord anymore, you were never saved. Right. It ain't rocket science. Because guess what? People who get saved, Holy Spirit's in you. You're not going to stop believing. You might doubt. You might be like John the Baptist who was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. But guess what? You're not going to lose faith totally. There's a difference between doubting and losing total faith. Now here's the last one. This is the last one I'll get into and it's going to be brief. And, you know, really I could go, like I said, I could go to more places. So don't confuse this with like, well, you know, he got to the third point which is explicit Bible scriptures. He only gave me a couple. No, I, I've already gave you some more, by the way. I mean, John John 4, John 6, Revelation 22, all those are verses on eternal security. But let me give you some real explicit ones, okay? So it says, I want to know explicit verses in the Bible that basically tell me I can't be saved. All right, let's look at them real quick. So, again, first we've seen you can't sin or doubt to lose salvation. Number two, We've seen that the nature of salvation itself is just totally, you can't lose it, totally against it. It's eternal, it's forever. Number three, I'm going to show you some explicit scriptures. Romans chapter 8. This is, this is probably the number one place most people would go to, and for good reason. Romans chapter 8 is so clear, you can't mess it up. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And you know how that's just repeated? Freely, 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 freely. You know, it's not earned. It's just free grace. Verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yeah, rather it that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are, all, all, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, Amen. our Lord. Yeah, but you can sin and lose it. Yeah, but you can doubt a little bit and lose your salvation. You see how stupid it is? It's like he went through everything under the sun imaginable. You know, let me read it again. It's just simple. 
There's not death, life, angels, principalities, powers, present, things to come, height, death. He just goes through it all. Nothing can separate you from the love of God once you're saved. Who can condemn those who God justifies? That's what I just now read you. Who can do it? Nobody. You say, well, how am I justified? By faith. By faith alone. Remember what I read in Galatians? Having begun by faith, are you now made perfect by works? No. By faith you're justified. And then we have here in Romans 8, who can condemn those who God justifies? Who can lay a charge against someone that God has freed from their sin, forgiven from their, their sin? Who can separate you once you're united to God? Nobody. Not even yourself. You can't, you can't do it. You wouldn't want to do it. Verse, you know, you say, well, there is something that can, that can separate you from the love of God. Okay, two things can separate you from the love of God. Ready? Nothing and nobody. That's what, that's, <laughs> that's what verse 38 and 39 says. Two things can separate you from the love of God. Nothing and nobody. That's what verse 38 and 39 says. John 10, real quick in closing, give you a few more verses. This is ammunition. You know, if it, we're, we start going, you know, evangelizing a little bit, and maybe you just try to witness somebody on your own. Maybe you got somebody you know that thinks you can lose salvation, and they say, well, why do you think you can't lose your salvation? Well, these are some just quick scriptures I'm going to give you, okay? John 10, 27, and I've already gave you a lot prior to that, says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. Remember that eternal life? Never thirst, never hunger again. You know, that's not very eternal if you can sin the next day and lose it. It's like, that's the briefest form of life I think is possible. It's yeah, it's eternal. It means forever. And they shall, get this, never perish. Right. Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. When you believe on Christ, you're justified, you're sealed with the Spirit, you will never perish. Right. That's clear as a bell what the Bible is teaching. You ever thought about this in John three sixteen? You ever thought about how clear it is? And how it actually, it's actually a verse that talks about eternal security, and once you're saved, you'll never lose it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him what, should what? Perish. Not perish. Should not perish, it says, but have everlasting life. So once you believe on Christ, you're not going to perish. So somebody comes along and tells you, well, you know, I know you believed on Christ, but you might perish. They're not saved. You see that. You say, that sounds harsh. Well, that's what Paul said in Galatians. Have you suffered in vain? This gets to the heart of the gospel, which is what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in your works or are you trusting in Christ alone by faith? And the last one I'll mention here, Hebrews 7. And again, this one right here is a very powerful argument by itself. This, this verse alone, if you think about this in Hebrews 7. Wherefore, talking about Jesus, and the book of Hebrews is deep. One of the deepest and harder to understand books of the whole Bible. And he's making a very complicated argument in a way, talking about how Jesus is, is the great high priest and he's greater than all the other ones and all this. Well, and just to make it really simple for you, I'll put it to you like this. Look at 25 in, in Hebrews 7. It says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by God, seeing he ever liveth, to make intercession for them. So, I mean, you get this picture in your mind where in heaven you have God the Father and then maybe you have the devil over here coming to say, hey, you know, Ashley sin today. You know, hey, Charles is doubting. The devil comes and accuses you before God. Well, you have a mediator. You have one in the middle. Whoever lives, it says. What sin are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, ever lives, it says. He never dies. He never takes a break. Jesus ain't on a lunch break. Oh, you know, he wasn't there interceding for me. He ever lives. He's always there. He's always, he's always there saying, no, I paid for his sin. The sin's gone. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. It's gone. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Right. Gone. Right. Gone. They're not there. They don't exist anymore. And Jesus ever lives. He's always there 
to give that testimony, to give that account for you. Yep. Once he's your Savior, he's always there. Now, these people that think you lose your salvation, just think of how absolutely ridiculous that is to say that, well, Satan's going to bring a charge to God in heaven and Jesus won't be able to intercede for it. I mean, it's, 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 it's asinine. And so, you know, I'm going to close there. I'll just say this in closing. You know, this is a, you say, well, there's so much scripture, you know, it's, it bored me stiff. There's so much scripture, I'm just bored to death. Well, that's a problem. Or you might say, well, you know what? I'm glad I got a few arguments. I now understand I get salvation. I understand I can't lose my salvation. Great. What does this mean going forward, though? Multiple times I made sure you understood that this is an important doctrine, not just for your personal life and your joy. To know, yeah, one day I'll fly away. One day I'm going to heaven. Not for my works, not because I'm good, but because God's good. Because God has blessed me with free grace. Because I just asked to say, hey, forgive me, please, I'm a sinner. Yes, you're saved in light of the cross, right? In light of what Jesus did. Well, you say, well, what, what do I do with this other than just be happy about it? We live in an area, guys. I would be willing to tell you that the majority of people do not agree with this doctrine. We live in a time when people will, they'll come to this church and leave it and go to one that thinks you can lose your salvation and they don't think it's a big deal. They don't think it's a big deal. No one cares. Oh, I go to that church over there. It's a big old church. They got some good music over there. I like it. They're teaching heresy. No one cares. It's a strange time we live in, man. Yeah. This, is, this is a foundational truth. Like, I would quit any church that disagreed on, on this. I would not ever go to a church that disagreed on this. Because they get, the, they get this wrong. They got the gospel wrong. The preaching will influence it. Every week, you better be careful. You might, you might fall from grace. You got the same people getting saved every couple months. Yeah. I mean, it's the most ridiculous sight you'd ever see. It affects everything. This is a major doctrine. And you need, you need to come alongside the people in your life that believe this wicked heresy that attacks the atonement of Christ, that attacks the grace of God, and you need to pull some people out of the fire. Because I know, I know people I know that i gotta, I got to go after and, say, and try to... I've already argued it. Dad watched me at Dairy Queen one day arguing one person over this. Are you willing to open your mouth about it? When someone comes on and says, well, I think you can lose your salvation. Are you willing to open your mouth? Or you just want to let them go to hell? Because I go ahead and tell you, if they think they can lose their salvation, 99% of the time, it's because they think they got to do some good work to keep it, which means they ain't saved to begin with. This is a serious deal. And so we all need to really go to the Lord and ask Him, you know, is there someone in our life that we can we could come alongside and help them understand the goodness of the gospel and that God loves us all and He would never cast us away as His children. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and your truth. I thank you, God, that I don't have to earn my salvation because if I did, I would never have it. And I thank you I don't have to do good works to keep it because if I did, I'd already lost it. And uh, the nature of salvation is a glorious thing. You are a gracious God. You're a merciful God. You're a patient God. Uh, you're a loving God, and you desire all to be saved. And I pray, God, that you would save people, that you would draw them, that you would help them to see their need, um, that you would do a work in our families, in our, in our community, in our churches. Um, God, even for the, the Presbyterian church over there, I pray that you'd send the you know, pastors resign. I pray that you'd send a pastor over there that's a Baptist, uh, you know, secret Baptist or something, or he changes mind or conforms them to good, sound doctrine. And all these churches around here, God, I want these people, whether they're Baptists or whatever they are, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to sound doctrine, so that they might please you and that you would work in their midst. Uh, not this humanistic, carnal, you know, uh, just try to do good deeds, but laboring in the work that you've called us to, God, which is seeing souls saved, preaching and teaching your word, and growing closer to you thereby. Uh, God, I just thank you for, for being so good and gracious. And uh, this morning, I, I want to I dwell on that more. I pray that you would bring it to my mind more throughout the day how great it is to be eternally saved by faith, not by works. And I, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.